so I, I'm very pleased to be here today. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be talking to you. And so I'm from the SETI Institute. And we're a nonprofit institute in Mountain View, California. Um, we do a lot of things, a lot of astrobiology, sorts of related stuff at the SETI Institute. And part of what we do is SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. We have our own telescope, and uh, we're doing that. Okay, so this is our own telescope. Uh, this is the Allen Telescope Array. It's a radio interferometer. <clears throat> it was designed really for SETI observations. It has a very wide field of view compared to other radio telescopes, so we can see all a big part of the sky at the, all at the same time. Uh, 1 to 10 gigahertz, which is the frequency range where the atmosphere is transparent to radio waves, and therefore uh, maybe not just our atmosphere, but other atmospheres, uh, this would be a good frequency range to uh, communicate with. Uh, we got 6.2 meter dishes, we have 42 of them. And the, the main thing I wanna tell you is that we are observing 12 hours a day every day, right? So this has been going on for years and will continue, I hope, for years. So, uh, and, and we have a system that, that does the analysis while the data are coming in, basically a near real-time system. And the reason that's interesting, we think, is because if you find something, you want to be able to look back right away before it disappears and, and verify that you actually saw something real. And um, so that's, that's how we do it. And, and so at the end of the day, at the end of 12 hours, I can tell you that we didn't see anything that day. You know, our, our analysis is done for the most part. Although, except for a caveat, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, also, I won't be telling you very much about uh, what we call Sonata, which is SETI on ATA. Um, this is our workhorse system that does very, very narrow band spectroscopy. So we're looking for signals that are like one hertz down to one one hundredth of a hertz. Um, and, and so there's nothing in nature that can produce radio signals, spectral lines this small, this narrow um, in nature, nothing that we know of. And you can imagine how cold something would have to be in order to do that. Um, and you know, the spectral lines are also broader than that. So anything that we find, we know it's probably not natural, it's probably artificial. And so that's why we do these narrow band searches. It's not that ET might not be transmitting a wide band signal or something. In fact, maybe that's even more likely. But we can't tell the difference between a wideband signal from a transmitter and a wideband signal from, say, a pulsar or a quasar or something, you know, without looking at it in more detail. Whereas if we find a one hertz wide signal, a very narrow signal, then we know for sure, hey, this is, looks like technology. Um, and so, as I'm saying, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about the, the Sonata observations, but I want you to know that they have been done. Here's a list of 10 stars that I don't want you to read, just so you know that there are 10 stars um, that we're probing uh, for the full 9 gigahertz bandwidth. And, uh, and so everything that I say will, will be in addition to this. So uh, the, the way that we've approached it historically is that we spend a little bit of time looking at a lot of different stars. So the idea is that if uh, we, we hope that the distribution of transmitters is such <clears throat> that uh, it, we're optimizing our benefit of, of finding a civilization by looking for strong transmitters, but just observing each star for only a brief amount of time. But th everything changes now that we have so much uh, great discoveries about the, the nearby stars and planets uh, around stars that we can start to do kinds of observations that we've only talked about in the past. And um, we can start experimenting with ways of doing these observations and see what we see. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the big problem with radio astronomy, Andrew just uh, uh, talked about this. And it's, uh, it's, you could call it lens flare. So basically, um, any camera, you know, you, you can sometimes get these, these features. Uh, and what that comes from is that there's a very bright source that is not in the field of view here. That's the sun. But because it's so bright, it actually creates features in the field of view. So we can zoom in on those, and you can see that you may get something that's sort of broad, scattered over the, 
the image or uh, images of the sun or streaks, stuff like that. We see all of those things in the radio frequency range because we have many, many strong transmitters on Earth that we make for ourselves. So um, we have to be able to look through this. Fortunately, none of the things that I'm showing you right here look like a tulip, right? So if you're looking for tulips you ha and you have an image, then you can say, aha, this looks like something that's real or no, this really looks like something that's interference. So uh, we use the uh, imaging system on the ATA. And here's uh, an image of the TRAPPIST-1 field that was taken just uh, April 6th <clears throat> at 2.8 gigahertz. Um, that thing in the that bright thing in the middle is not TRAPPIST-1. That's actually a quasar. Um, the stars, ordinary stars, especially like red dwarfs, they don't have enough radio emission to be visible from Earth in the radio, even though they seem to be bright in some other frequencies. So uh, what we expect to see is nothing at all when we point to Trappist. Unfortunately, you know, that's what we see. Um, but I will point out, though, that you know, we, we can tell that that's a quasar because it's, it's a point on this sky. You know? It's just in one place, and it's not anywhere else. Whereas over on the right, I have a picture of radio frequency interference. So basically, the radio interference comes in from the side of the telescope, and it can't form an image. It just sort of makes a splat over the whole image field. And so we can easily tell, using this imaging technique, the difference between interference and something that's really coming from outer space. So I'm not going to go through these very much. We a list of 10 uh, interesting stars. 1.2 Earth radii, 39 light years away. Uh, we're interested in stars that have pulsars behind them, which we can talk about after if you're interested. Um, 1990, uh, sorry, 2015, uh, Boyajen uh, found this star, or published this star, you know, Kick 8, 846 2852. <laughs> and um, so, as soon as we found out about this star, you know, it, it, you know, it's very interesting because the, over on the right there, we're seeing the, the light curve as a function of time. And you, the, the light from the star, it has these dips uh, where, where something appears to be passing in front of the star at certain times. And we don't know what that stuff is. It's a very interesting uh, signal and a very strong signal, but it's, it's unknown. So, we, we had the hypothesis that perhaps that this was something to do with technology, and so maybe we should study this star really well. So we did our usual Sonata thing with uh, all the narrowband stuff, and we didn't find anything unusual. And then we did uh, what we call a power beam search. Where basically, uh, the idea is sort of the breakthrough idea of using a light sail, uh, in this case, a microwave sail, to uh, as a rocket engine to push spacecraft through the planetary systems. And if um, there were such a thing, and, and it were to have that, oh, let's see, does this have a? If, if it were to have um, a, a very, very powerful microwave transmitter that was perhaps pushing around spacecraft, uh, it would look sort of like the red. That's what we think. Uh, it would look like. And so that's the signal that we think that we could detect. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Um, now, all this other stuff is all interference. Everything is interference in this game. And, uh, but what we could beat down the interference as far as this, uh, as far as about like uh, one on this scale of 10 to the 19 watts for a transmitter. And so anything above this one here, we can form images of those uh, radio transmit or uh, the, the signals that we see. And we can tell if they're really coming from outer space or if they're just local. And all of them are local. We didn't find anything that looked to be coming from outer space. So this was in 2015. Um, now, of course, everybody's really excited about Travis One. We're among them. Um, once again, this is an image, but it's in reverse color, just to give you something else to look at. So TRAPPIST-1 is at the crosshair in this image. And you can easily see that with our resolution element uh, over here on the lower left, um, if 
there was something, you know, we can tell the difference between coming from TRAPPIST-1 and coming from a quasar in the near field. So we, we know that uh, that bright spot isn't TRAPPIST-1. Okay, so uh, this is a nice simulation that uh, Graham uh, McIntosh and John Richards put together where uh, it's all the planets of TRAPPIST-1 assuming that they're in a plane and uh, just looking at the uh, line of sight. So Earth, imagine, is down on the floor. That's where you are. Now, sometimes there's a planet that will go behind the star, as we see with the yellow and purple that just went behind. Um, whenever that happens, that's an occlusion. So if there were a strong signal coming from that direction, then uh, whenever it goes behind the star, because the star is opaque to radio signals, it would go away. And so this is very much like the, the transit game, except we're doing it the other way around, where we expect, we're looking for a decrease in the emission whenever something goes behind. Um, and, uh, but then there's also another situation where the planets just line up. So the idea here is that you have a civilization that's populated more than one planet in, in its system. And so they're communicating with each other. They have high power, high bandwidth communication links to, to send information back and forth, which you might expect. And so at the times whenever those planets line up with the line of sight from Earth, then you might expect that, say, the purple planet, a transmitter from there, some of the transmission will blow by the green planet and actually make it into our receiver. So this is, and because this is such a nearby star, you know, again, we can start thinking about doing these things, you know, with a reasonable sensitivity. So here's a list of the observations we recently done. There, April 6th, April 12th, we had a double conjunction. April 17th, we did an occultation, and we got two more occultations planned. Um, we're using uh, four different uh, what we call back-end systems. Basically, our telescope has multiple analysis equipment hanging off of it. The correlators are the imagers. So we got two imagers working at different frequencies, 8.2 and 2.8 megahertz, gigahertz. And uh, you can see the field of view there. It's fairly large, a degree at 2.8. Uh, we also have beams. These are synthetic beams. These are uh, made from the entire array. Uh, uh, looking at just one space on, point on the sky. And you can see that the field of view of those very narrow beams is much smaller, as you would expect. Um, but we are capturing the raw data from those, the raw voltages that come in from that. And then uh, in a collaboration with IBM, we're uploading this data to the cloud and doing kinds of uh, processing that we could not afford to do otherwise. Um, so lots of cool stuff happening. Uh, this is that image again, so remember that uh, we can always do this. If we find anything interesting, the first thing we'll do is make an image like this, and we'll say, does it look like this or like this? Okay, but I'm not going to show you any more images. Instead, I'm going to show you uh, basically light curves. So this is uh, pointed at TRAPPIST-1 on April 6th, and uh, there was a conjunction event at the red line, and uh, there was sort of an interesting uh, bright event that happened uh, sort of around hour 18. And you know, if we, this had happened under the red line, we would probably be fairly excited. But it didn't. You know, It, it just shows you the, the radio frequency interference that, that we have around our telescope is just so prevalent. Um, we really need to have some special indicators like a certain time or looking from only a certain place on the sky in order to tell whether the signal is really coming from outer space or not. So we didn't find anything interesting in that. And we're doing more analyses with the data that I talked about. Uh, here's another one. This is a, an occlusion event done with the HAT P11 star. Um, it's also uh, uh, got an exoplanet, obviously. And, and so in this case, we're looking for dips, right? So you should look for a, a dark region uh, as a function of time whenever the planet goes behind the star. And we don't see anything in this case. So we can put limits on what is the strongest transmitter that could be transmitting from that direction. So uh, to summarize, we're always using our Sonata system to do these narrowband searches from 1 to 10 gigahertz. So you should just keep that in your mind. That's, all, that's our bread and butter. 
But then we're also doing these occultation studies where we look for dips uh, in the, the images uh, as a function of uh, time, and also conjunction observations where we look for peaks as a function of time. So it's all the same games that everybody plays with every other kind of spectroscopy, except we're doing it for SETI. Now, um, we've recently become very interested in, in doing high-speed data processing in the cloud, doing very, very powerful processing, applying machine learning techniques. And so, uh, just as a preview, um, we've set up a, uh, a code challenge, which everybody in the world is invited to join, and a uh, associated uh, hackathon, which will be in San Francisco in June, um, uh, to take signals that, that uh, look like they came from the ATA and try to find the best analysis tools, make new analysis tools for that. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Uh, I confess that I do not spend a lot of time thinking about radio observations from stars at all. Um, are there are there situations where you detect the radio emission from the star itself, where you're looking for this light curve of the flux dimming during Alpha Centauri? I don't know. Can, can we even see the flux from Alpha Centauri in the radio? Brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs. Oh, you like can. Okay, so this is Mrs. Brown Dwarf here. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's, it's interesting. It was totally unpredicted and unexpected, but brown dwarfs flare and give radio uh, signals. And nobody's rushed to say that's engineering. They have <laughs> much more compelling explanations in terms of astrophysics. Thanks. Uh, Jim Pittsburgh of Microwave Sciences. Hi, Jim. Uh, let me give you an alternative explanation for the event you showed. It's not a communication link you're looking at. You're looking at a beam, a power beam, driving a spacecraft between these very these planets, which are very close to each other and see each other as disks. Mm -hmm. The transit time for a very fast craft at say 300 kilometers per second, which you could do with a microwave power beam, uh, would be on the order of hours. Your event occurs two hours later. If you do an order orbital analysis, you might find out that's a useful trajectory between some of those planets. Just have a, somebody look at it. Sure. A and watch you know somebody. One. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's it's uh, Graham McIntosh uh, uh, at IBM, so it's been a great, great. project to work with you guys. So uh, I, it's a question, but it's also I, I'd like to get your comment on this, um, Jill and Jerry. The, the occultation side of what we are doing, uh, in a way, I find more intriguing than the conjunction because we spend a lot of time talking about biomarkers and oxygen detection. Leakage is for kind of post-biological, what oxygen is for what, for biological. It's, it's just normal stuff coming off the planet because of a civilization doing whatever it does but it's super weak. And the reason we love, love, love these uh, brown dwarfs is the planets are tight and you get lots and lots and lots of orbits. They, they're getting detected by transit, so by definition there's an occultation so we can do data folding over and over and over and over and over within you know, dozens of them in a month. Or and, a year. Or a year, and that adds up. And so, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So my, my comment is that if you, if you buy into kind of the notion that bio biology kind of progresses like we have until evolution just stops, and the only way, you know, you progress intelligence is by engineering it, then you really kind of have to start to think about um, getting past biomarkers, and as Jill said at the beginning, look for technology markers instead. It, it, may, be, it may be that a really thriving civilization is pretty biologically sterile, and, and so that, that's why this Good. is kind of interesting. One last question from Joseph. Dimitar Sasso, um, uh, What is the proper motion of TRAPPIST-1 with respect to that nearby quasar, and do you know the projected um, uh, separation I'm in afraid the stromic I, I, I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I mean, potentially, could you use it as a background source? Yeah, as a fiducial, sure. 
Um, but I don't know if the, the proper motion is large enough. You know, our resolution of our instrument is rather low um, compared to like an optical telescope. So, you know, it'd be hard to use that. Thank you.